Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is supported by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Telecommunications, Access Minnesota, and Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and online at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. We're glad you're with us on this rainy, wet, snowy, sleety night. Our, our program this evening is on non-game wildlife. It's something that I think all Minnesotans love. Everybody, whether they're urban or rural, has a place in their heart for wildlife. And uh, our, our guest this evening is really, truly an expert on wildlife. And we're going to come back to her in just a moment. But we're going to start the program out with a little piece that Annie Cook did last summer on getting the lead out of birds and the impact that lead is having. You want to be out here, but first you have to head in here to pick up some gear. You may not know it, but there's a newer option out there, lead-free fishing tackle. It is something that is starting to grow in demand. It's not a heavily demanded product, but I think people are becoming more aware that there is a need for that. These lead-free products help protect Minnesota's bird population. Lead is a fatal toxin for birds with gizzards. And once it circulates to the body, then it affects the nervous system. It just shuts everything down. And it's not just waterfowl like loons that are affected. No, this poison starts a chain reaction. We've seen some trouble that uh, we've had some die offs with uh, eagles because what they're doing is preying on uh, sick or dying waterfowl that have got. Uh, They've, they've got the lead poisoning already. The state already prohibits the use of leaded shot for waterfowl hunting, but it's during other hunting seasons and when people go fishing that lead can get into the lakes. Using lead-free shotgun ammunition is becoming increasingly common, but for fishing gear, the new lead-free products are nearly three times as expensive as leaded. The non-lead is a little more expensive, but I think as manufacturing improves, they'll probably bring that cost down. And as far as function and form, the lead-free is right there with traditional tackle. Any kind of sinkers they produce in non-lead, uh, jig heads, you know, anything that uh, is weighted, really, you know, they can make into a non-lead product. The choice between leaded or unleaded gear really depends on what you feel is more important, cost or conservation. For Lakeland News at 10, I'm Annie Cook. My guest this evening is Pam Perry, who is a wildlife specialist and a wildlife biologist. And she's been with the non-game wildlife program since its very inception. In fact, she's probably one of three or four staff members who have been in the program since the beginning. Pam, thank you for coming. I'm really excited to have you here because I know I've known you a long time and you, yes. you truly are an expert in, in this area. And it's uh, nice to have you here. Thanks. Thanks, it's great to be here. Maybe you could just, just I know probably a lot of people know about the uh, wildlife, the non-game wildlife program, but there probably are viewers out there that really don't know how it got started, what it is, what, what is the purpose of it. Maybe you could just give us a little background about the program itself. Sure, sure. Non-game wildlife program was started around 1980, and the reason was it needed a funding source to help wildlife that wasn't hunted or trapped. I mean, those kinds of wildlife, like deer and ducks and grouse, uh, are managed and people work on them. There's habitat, wildlife management areas, all purchased through license revenues. But there was no source of funding for the non-hunted things. And so there was legislation introduced, and finally a funding source came in, and what it was was donations. This is the checkoff on the tax forms. When you do your Minnesota income tax, there's the loon there. And all that money stays in Minnesota, goes directly to our program. So that was about 1980. I was hired in 1982. I was in the first round of staff to come on. I had been working down in Florida as a wildlife biologist. And I was from Minnesota originally. And I thought, what a great opportunity to come back, a brand new program. And I've been working with the program ever since then. So it's, it's going on 28 years now. And uh, probably early on, it was known as the chickadee check it off. I mean, I, mean, I know was. that was kind of what it was called. It was, early which on. was catchy, and and they wanted people to be aware. That having something on the tax forms was so new, and so calling it a chickadee check off, people could relate to that. Knew it was going for non-hunted species, and those donations could come in that way. Now, the folks that work in this program, uh, and you have different regions across the state. We do, uh, and you are actually a DNR, a DNR employee but you actually get your money through the checkoff program and donations, don't you? We do, we do. And sometimes we'll get a little project money for, uh, from another source, 
But what the main source, 80, 85% of our funding still comes from Chekhov. And are Minnesotans pretty generous with the program? They are. They are. We have one of the best programs in the country. Um, in recent years, our budget has been around a million dollars. Wow. So, and, and, and now and it decreased. Last year was a tough year for all nonprofits. Sure. And uh, you know, we're not exactly a nonprofit, but living on donations sometimes makes us feel that way. We feel very accountable to the public because these are the people that give their $10 or $20 on the tax forms. And um, we know we want to multiply that money. We do a lot of work and coordination with other people. We want to spread it as far as we can, really, to make it go far. Now, I know you said from the uh, early years, your, your role has changed a little bit more in that you're getting more connected to lakes. Could you just talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah, well, uh, for about the first 25 years, I, I was a, what was called a regional non-game specialist, and I had a broad variety of duties, everything from backyard wildlife to, I did some work on loons, I did work on bats, and turtles, and I mean, all sorts of things, but these last few years, now, it shifted, and it's a focus on lakes, and I thought that was a very appropriate thing in the uh, Brainerd Lakes area. Uh, we have all the lakes here, and that's really where a lot of my interest was, and so this, this has been great. So I'm doing a little less of some of those other things, focusing more on lakes, loons, wildlife that's associated with those lakes. Now, is that unique to your role, or does, or does that affect all of the specialists no. across the state? It's, it's u unique to me. Okay. So I am the lake specialist within our program now. And we have other, uh, uh, some of our other biologists also specialize in certain things, and they're different, but mine is the lakes. Could you tell us where these locations are for those wildlife specialists across the state? Sure, sure. We, ha <laughs> we have one in St. Paul in uh, our Warner Road office there, one in Rochester, and she works a lot on the Blufflands and that in southeastern Minnesota. We have a biologist in New Ulm, and she works more with farmland, prairie issues, things like that. Uh, another specialist in Bemidji, and she does a lot of forestry work, working with, you know, with the habitats, the things that are in northwestern Minnesota. And then uh, the, uh, the last office is um, Grand Rapids, and then I'm in Brainerd. Annie started her program off this evening with loons, and I know you have a lot of experience with loons. What's going on with our loons in Minnesota? We call them our loons, although well, they're just Of course they're here. our loons. <laughs> they're only here for a <laughs> short time. But... Are, they're, they're our state bird. Um, we feel the population is steady. Now, we have the largest common loon population in the lower 48 states. About 12,000 adults is what we estimate. And if you want to compare that with other states, Maine is the second highest. Now, we're taking out Alaska, so we're just the lower 48. Maine has about 5,000. Wisconsin, maybe 2,300. We have 12,000 loons here. I mean, we, and people, well, oh, why does Minnesota have so many loons? Well, we have the lakes. We have the mm -hmm. habitat for them. We have these mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful lakes. Uh, we have two loon survey programs. One's called the Minnesota Loon Monitoring Program. Um, one's called the uh, Volunteer Loon Watcher Survey. And both of them employ volunteers. We work a lot with the public because it's a huge job to do it. The monitoring program is kind of keeps a finger on the pulse of where is the population? Is it going up or down? Because we want to know, is it steady or not? And that's the one we're using to say, we think it's steady right now. We're, we think it's hanging right in there. The other one, the Volunteer Loon Watcher Survey, and I coordinate that statewide. We have 400 or so volunteers in there spread out on lakes all across the state. And they're watching their loons. They're working with their lake association. And they're saying, well, um, reporting to me in the fall, but then working with the people there to make sure that they, their loon chicks have the best chance they can to survive and that people appreciate the loons. And we do have a website that we're going to be flashing across our screen for people that might want to connect into that particular website. Sure. There was a, a real scare a year or two ago about losing loons in the Wisconsin area. Uh, I don't remember if it was a virus or what, but there was a, a large die-off. You, could you tell us anything about that? Yeah, that was, that was a toxin. It was a botulism toxin. And as I remember, it was on Lake Michigan. Okay, so it was mostly centered around Michigan. You, and what, what and causes that? Well, it, it, this, the, the, there were um, mussels, exotic mussels, that were concentrating the botulism toxins, and then um, fish were eating those, and the loons were eating the fish and getting wow. a lethal dose. And they have That's recovered it. from that? 
Well, it hasn't, it was just the, the conditions were right for it. Um, but the, the, the hard thing about that one is it was triggered by an exotic species, something that what shouldn't have been in the food chain in the first place. And we're really hoping it doesn't happen again. We're really hoping it doesn't spread into Lake Superior. What, what are the major predators for loons? Oh, they don't have any. Once they're adults, they're, they're at the top. When they're chicks, the little chicks, I mean, then they get eaten by big fish, snapping turtles, eagles, ravens, raccoons, anything that can catch them when they're so little. They're really but once they get full size, nothing, nothing messes bothers with them. them. Not yeah. even eagles will bother the animal. Oh, not unless they're sick. Oh, okay. You know, otherwise, uh, a loon is a formidable <laughs> thing. That's, and I've handled a few, and they're, they're very strong and very quick, and you know, they're, they're kind of the, at the top there. You know, one of the things you and I have talked about, and I know there's a lot of discussion about, is the climate changing. Is it earth warming? <sighs> and one of the things that I've been reading lately is that a lot of the interest in climate change is actually coming from sportsmen's groups who believe they're seeing climate change affecting the animals they hunt. And one of the things that you and I have talked about a little bit is how we're noticing a difference in bird ranges in Minnesota. Yeah. Could you just talk a little bit about what you're seeing? Yeah, there is a lot of concern about that because wildlife is dependent on the habitats and if the habitats start changing, then that's going to change. Some of the species certainly we're seeing that are, are moving further north are cardinals. And we've talked about cardinals. I mean, they are definitely spreading north. When I grew up in the Twin Cities a while ago, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, 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 there were cardinals in the Twin Cities. They went up to St. Cloud or so, but not much further north. When I first moved to Brainerd, there were no cardinals here. We had a lot of cardinals and here. How far that was in the 80s when I first moved how, up How here. far have they moved to the north? Oh, they're all the way up into northern Minnesota. We did kind of a cardinal survey uh, a couple of years ago, something my husband did with some of his uh, students at the Forest View Middle School. And um, they were way, way up close to the, close to the Canadian border. Not in large numbers, but you know, you'd get one here, one there, all over. Another species, red-bellied woodpecker, which is a uh, southern woodpecker species for the most part, has just been pushing its way further north. Um, you know, that's the, when you see those things and when, you, when you've lived for a few decades and you start seeing these changes already happening right in front of your eyes, I think that's something to be concerned about. And I know in our area, I used to see a lot of gross beaks, evening gross beaks. Uh, I don't see them at all. I don't know if that means, is, has their range changed? It has. I don't know a lot about why and how. But they do think the population, they know the population has shifted. They do, I think some people believe it's really gone down. Uh, again, in the early 80s, uh, we used to have huge flocks of gross beaks coming into our feeders. I mean, it was a challenge to keep the feeders full. And you have 100 gross beaks come in, we haven't had much. We'll mm -hmm. maybe get one or two a winter that we see. It's pretty dramatic. And do you, are those birds most likely then to the north of us? They haven't to come the down north, this or even shifting east, or you know, there's it's just shifting. Okay. Those are shifting. So some are shifting north, and we and we think it's changes in habitat and so maybe in climate. You know, it's hard to tell yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, time will tell as it goes along, but um, definitely there are changes out there, and we're seeing them. How about a species that's been introduced across much of Minnesota, at least from the central portion south, the wild turkey? <laughs> <laughs> That's been an interesting uh, phenomena because I, I don't think people thought they could survive here. No, at first they, well, they, at first they, they thought they could come up kind of into Morrison County, Little Falls area where all the oaks are, maybe Southern Crow Wing County. And I, they thought they'd come up about that far. And there were releases. I mean, the, the turkey, the wild turkey hasn't spread just on its own. There have been releases and this is for sportsmen and have hunting opportunities as well. But these turkeys have thrived much more than I think anyone ever thought. And we, we had a pretty good flock at our house this past year. And they started coming. We started seeing them about three years ago, I would say. But, but, and they're, they're working their way up the Red River Valley area, you know, western Minnesota, up through there. They still do best in areas where there's a lot of oak trees, uh, hardwoods. Um, but they also will use the agricultural areas, the waste grains and the fields. And I, what I have observed myself in this area is that they'll shift their ranges in the winter 
I think they're going into the more egg areas and then they're moving back out into pastures and woods in the summer. And I know you wanted to talk a little bit about purple martins and, and you also maybe would share a little bit of that story of what's going on around Mille Lacs, Lake Mille Lacs with some of the martin uh, bird houses that are being developed. Yeah, purple martins are very interesting species right now because I think everyone knows what a purple martin is and everyone kind of grew up seeing purple martin houses at almost every farmstead all over. And they've disappeared in a lot of places in Minnesota. I mean, we've had a huge population decline, 3.9% per year for the last 40 years. Per that, year? Per year. Wow. And, and this is a long-term, dramatic decline. There, there's a number of reasons for it. It includes competition with house sparrows and starlings, which are exotic species. It also includes increases in predators. It includes the fact that they've become so dependent on man-made housing that if that housing isn't maintained well enough, they don't do well. and They don't, aren't using natural nesting spots anymore. So that's one of the reasons why our new poster this year for the non-game program features Which we have Purple here. Martins. Yes. And yes. you said that is actually a photographer from the Brainerd Lakes area? Yes, yes. The photo on our new poster is, um, uh, the, uh, the, fo the photograph is done by Larry Leonard, who is a Purple Martin landlord right here in Brainerd. And um, I think he did a lovely job. We, we looked at a lot of different photos and we just decided this one was really nice. So it's our featured species and our featured poster. People who want a copy of this poster, they should ask their tax preparer when they go in to do their taxes, they make a donation to the checkoff, they get a poster. If they do their taxes themselves, just come into a DNR office, and like here in Brainerd, poster. like me, and we'll give you a poster. Okay, so what you're saying, it sounds like, Pam, is that people could have a lot to do with bringing these birds back. Yes, yes, and so there is a, um, a movement afoot in Minnesota, it's called the Purple Martin Working Group, and it's a collaborative between biologists and citizens and the uh, citizens are often the Purple Martin landlords, and these are people who've been working with Purple Martins for a long time, and they're working to bring them back to show people what's the best way to manage these houses, how can you really make it work for Martins. You mentioned uh, the, the situation around Mille Lacs Lake. I, I had noticed a few years ago that Martins had increased dramatically around Mille Lacs Lake, and I didn't know why, and I just, because I go bird watching over there, and I love the lake, so I go over, there, and I found out it was due to one person, and he was the biologist with the Mille Lacs Band. His name is Kelly Applegate. He's the head of the Purple Martin Working Group right now, and he is just like a driving force to bring Martins back into Minnesota. And around a lake area, we might add, is a really ideal situation, yes. isn't it, for Martins? Yes, they really do like the lake shores. And uh, I find and see Martin colonies regularly when I'm out on the lakes during the summer. And so it's a good place. They like it open. They like the flying insects, and they're wonderful to have around because they'll eat the biting insects as well. So have you seen that decline level off? Not or yet. Or is it still occurring? Not yet. It's, it's still occurring. Yeah. Yeah, the latest data, it was still in there. And, and what is their major predator? Oh, for purple martins, the Cooper's hawk, which is a bird hawk. It's a medium-sized hawk that hunts mostly birds, and that's just the right size, and uh, great horned owls as well, and the great horned owls like to sneak in at night and take nestlings. And you said something about when they de <coughs> design their houses, they should take into consideration predators being able to reach in? Yeah, yeah. One of the things we've learned over the last few years is that some of the older houses, the compartments were too narrow, too short, from the entrance hole back to where the nest was. And these, the hawks and the owl has le have learned to reach in there grab the young ones and just take them out. So they have to be deeper. And all the new Purple Martin house plans, because a lot of people build them, they make them out of wood, um, are deeper so that it's just further back, they can't reach in and get them. Another success story in Minnesota, I think, has been the trumpeter swan. Oh, yes. Have you been involved with some of those projects? Yes, I have, I have. And, and trumpeter swans are uh, largest waterfowl species in North America. Um, it was, this was one of the first projects we worked on in the non-game program as a reintroduction to bring something back because trumper swans had been lost around the 19, early 1900s. We lost them from the state. Um, Hennepin County Parks, which is now Three Rivers Parks, was starting to work on bringing them back, doing a breeding program. 
Uh, but the head of the non-game program, Carol Henderson, decided, he thought, what a great way. If we were going to have money to bring something back, let's go to Alaska, get trumpers, swan eggs, hatch them. They were brought back to the Carlos Avery game farm, hatched, raised, and then released. And we now have a very good trumpeter swan population in Minnesota. And so that's been accomplished in just uh, in less than 25 years. Do you have any idea what the estimates are for the number of birds that there oh, are? It's over 2,000. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And if people want to see trumpeter swans now in the winter, uh, Monticello. I saw that on TV. Monticello oh. has a wonderful spot for it. They even have a viewing platform, the city of Monticello. People can go on the website for Monticello and just look yeah. it up. But uh, it's right on the Mississippi River there. And the, the uh, water stays unfrozen longer because of the power plant there, the Sherco plant. But we also see trumpeters right here in Brainerd because there, we have some on the Gull River, we have some on the Crow Wing River. As long as those areas are open, we've got trumpeter swans flying around here, which I think is very, very cool as now, well. In, in that Monticello area, is that, a, is that an individual feeding them or is that, a, is that a project of a club or how do they keep them there? Um, they stay because of the open water and because people feed them. There is, there is one woman there who feeds many, many hundreds of pounds of, of grain. There's other people who feed as well, but she has been the main person feeding there and has done it for quite a number of years. And when the population was smaller, I think they really need it. Now she can't even keep up with it. And the swans do have to fly out to the fields to get food and that. But uh, that's where they're overwintering. And it, it is the largest overwintering concentration in the Midwest. And we have it right here now in and, Minnesota. And those that are leaving the state and migrating, where are they going to? Oh, you know, that originally we wanted them all to migrate. And some did, and some went to like Nebraska, some went to Georgia. You know, they, it was like all over the place. At, but the mortality was really high. Some got shot, some hit power lines. There were just so many hazards because these birds really didn't know what they were doing. Wow. Yeah, and so, so it's there's still for them a, to stay. Well, we've debated that. We're, we're not sure, but, but it doesn't seem like there's the really good wintering areas anymore for them, or not as many. There are still birds that migrate out of the state, but we have this bunch that stays. We have a big bunch that stays. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. You, uh, could you give us some bird feeding tips? Because right now is really what probably a lot of us think is a big peak bird feeding time, although some people feed year round and there's not a change. But if someone wanted to start attracting birds in Minnesota, I mean, what, what would be the best thing yeah. that they could start doing? Yeah, and we think of it primarily in the winter. I feed year round, but that's because I like having birds around my house all year round. Um, the, the bigger variety of birds, the larger the variety that you want, you need to have a variety of feeders, a variety of food. If you're going to start with, let's say just one, you're going to want to start with uh, black oil sunflower. And then add some suet, suet cakes or regular suet, some corn maybe, and a, maybe a millet mix that you put on the ground. I also like to use peanuts. If you want cardinals, you want safflower seed. You mean peanuts in the shell? or No, peanuts, you, you can buy them like at Lake oh, okay. Farm or you okay. know, in, in any of the wild bird stores. Um, and I just put them in a tube feeder like this, but the woodpeckers really like those too. So you know, though, that's your basics, sunflower, suet, some corn, because it's cheap, a lot of things like corn, um, a millet mix, which is all the little round seeds with other stuff in. You just throw that on the ground for some of the like juncos and, and some of those species. And then if you really want cardinals, try some safflower seed. Safflower? Safflower. Safflower. I'm yeah. not familiar with that. What is that? It's, it's a whitish seed that a lot of the other birds don't care much for and squirrels don't seem to like at all. Really? Yeah. So do you, would you feed them on the ground or in a feeder? On, uh, you, you could spread it on the ground or put it in a trolley feeder. Okay. So, but, but I do recommend get a variety, get a few different feeders and set up. If you've never um, had a bird feeding station in your backyard before, it's going to take a while to get the birds there. They don't just automatically come like this because they have territories all set up. And that's why when, when you go to somebody's house and they've been feeding birds for a long time. I went to a house um, east of Brainerd here over on one of the lakes towards Garrison. They had 49 feeders. Wow, that's a lot of feeders. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's an investment. That's a pretty big investment. <laughs> and the birds were spectacular. 
Oh, and I'll mention one more thing. If you want finches, the Niger thistle seed. It won't grow thistles in your yard. It's not a Canada thistle or anything like that, uh, but a, a thistle mix or some sort of finch mix really works well for your gold finches, purple finches, those. We're down to the last couple of minutes here, but could you just briefly talk about some of the other things that your program works with? I know it's not just birds. What are some of the other things that you work with? Non-game covers so many different species. Um, a couple of them that I've had real interest in that people don't think of right away are turtles. And we have two state-listed threatened turtles in the state. One's the Blanding's turtle, which is found quite a bit in this area through, um, through the Brainerd area. The other one's the wood turtle, which is more in eastern Minnesota. Um, turtles have issues because of water quality and roads. Number one mortality is just roads and, and then water degradation. You know, those are a couple species people don't think of very much. Um, I try to get people to like snakes a little better. That's a hard one sometimes, but we don't have anything that's dangerous here in the state either. Um, frogs, we have a frog monitoring program. Uh, because a, a lot of people are interested in frogs and what's going on with frogs, and certainly they're facing some environmental challenges. So if per, a person were interested in working in the program, they could contact their local DNR office and it, probably get the information from those people about how to get in touch with the specialists in the program. Would that sure. be, be the sure. best thing to and do? Sure, and say they're interested in the non-game program because we have uh, several programs that use volunteers, especially with the Loon Watcher Survey and with the frog monitoring. Great. Well, Pam, thanks for being on the program. It's a, it was a worthwhile program that you're involved with, and it's great to see people investing in those animals and plants that we don't think of as being for the table. Yeah, not for the table, but that we all enjoy. Right. Thanks a Very lot much. for being Thank on the you, show. Thank you, Ray. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about, and I bet one of the things you're talking about this week is football. Go Vikings. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.